Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope you're all well, and yes. it's a lovely day today. The sun's shining bright, and welcome to Hope Church. Uh, our church is not just a building, I keep saying, it's a family, and those who are here and those who are watching online, you know, it's a great privilege uh, to bless you all in this service. I really hope that this service will be a blessing to all of us. Uh, including me, as we come together as a family of God, in the presence of God, to worship God. Isn't it an absolute privilege that we all come from various backgrounds, ages, uh, countries? <laughs> and it's amazing to come together as the children of God and to worship God because He is worthy of all our praise. And we worship God every Sunday because He is alive. He is alive and we worship the living God. I usually start a service uh, with a bit of a light-hearted note. I just read this joke once. Uh, a Scottish bandit went uh, to the, across the borders in an English town and robbed a bank. Yes, robbed a bank, took a ton of money and he just crossed back into Scotland. But this English constable said, no, 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 I'm not going to let this loose. So he chased them all the way across the back of Scotland. And they went up north in, in a very wee village. And there, the constable went into the shop and said, do you know Ian McGregor? Well known of looting all the money from the bank. And he said, why, I, I, I didn't know Ian. He just sits there, like in the pub, and having a drink. And the constable goes there, and how dare you take all this money? I've been ordered. Basically, took the gun and said, "Shoot to kill you, because you have robbed a lot of bank uh, and a lot of money." But to his surprise, the Scots didn't speak English. He was a Gaelic speaker. And the pop owner said, no, oh, I'm bilingual, I'm translate for you. So the constable goes along with his pop owner and says, are you Ian McGregor? And he translates in the Gaelic language and he says, yes, I'm here. Are you the pastor who brought all the back and brought all the money? And there's a translation going on. He's like, do you take all the money? And he said, yes. You know, I got an order, shoot the pill, or oh, it just shows where the money is. That's what he's trying to do. And then basically this guy said, you know what, I've been caught. Just tell the constable, if you just go outside the village, there's a hollow tree, take a left, and there's another hollow tree, dig around six feet deep, and there's a stash of money there. Yeah. All the money is stored there. The pub owner looks at him in a mischievous way and looked at the constable and said, Shoot the cat. <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole idea of all this kind of language and how you know, different people from different backgrounds of life speak different languages. And you know, it's amazing that we all can come together today in the presence of God in this beautiful day and worship God as well. And I really hope that God will speak to us as we open our minds and that he will speak to us clearly to our hearts and our soul as well. So let's begin our service with the call to worship. We have a mighty friend in Jesus who is enthroned in the heavens. So let's come closer to God. Let's stay true to what He is for us. Amen. Let us now sing our first hymn, first verse, to the Lord, 
Yesterday I was uh, at the Presbytery meeting and it was a great privilege to see Brian Porteous who was uh, the ordained local minister at uh, Temple Hall in Turbane uh, being uh, in, in inducted as the moderator for the next year and it was truly a blessing. So please pray for Brian as uh, he's going to go and speak to many churches, maybe speak in unions and um, bring together all the things that um, the moderator does. Uh, so please pray for him as he embarks on this journey. Let us come together in God in prayer. Gracious God, our loving Father, we rejoice because you have welcomed us to come to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, you are the most high God, the God of absolute purity in whom there is no darkness at all. Lord Jesus, friend of sinners, 
who ate and drank with the tax collectors and the outcasts, who reached out to lepers and beggars and people who were possessed with evil spirits, whose closest friend included men, women, and little children of all ages, all were invited to him. Lord, we rejoice in a God who came to seek and save the lost and to invite everyone to repent and to enter the kingdom of God as they recognize you as the Messiah, the Savior sent from God. Merciful God, we rejoice that you continue to welcome people into your church today. Not the self-righteous or the arrogant who don't think they need to be saved, but everyone regardless of background, of age or gender. Anyone who freely confesses that you are God, asks you to be their savior and makes you their Lord and King. Holy Spirit, we pray that this building will be a place of welcome. We pray that the people who make up this church would embody that welcome. That by our acts of kindness and gracious words to those around us might experience your love in action. And so we ask you to continue to build your church here in Kokode. Use us as your living stones in this building process. Encourage us. Empower us so that your glory and your majesty and your power and your love might shine out in our community. So that many will come and receive the healing that Jesus offers them. Lord, in this time, we pray that you would receive our praise and thanksgiving. Forgive us our sins. Encourage us in our faith so that we can fix our eyes on Jesus, our Savior. We pray the prayer you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the same Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. Usually, I feel frozen out during the winter seasons over here because there's a cold draft that comes in, but today I feel a bit hot. <laughs> and I brought a mat, oh, a cushion I would say, and just imagine that I have broken a leg folks, and that I am just sitting here and going to lie down. <laughs> And hopefully, I request all of you to come forward and to carry me all the way out. <laughs> walk around the parish and also take me to the doctors nearby for an appointment. Could you do that? <laughs> Any strong people? I am quite heavy. I can assure you that. And just imagine if we go to the doctor and there's a lot of people sitting over there. And you have to carry me all the way up because there's an emergency force. And you are just going to open up the roof all of a sudden and you have to drop me right through the roof. 
to the doctor. Would you be able to do that? I don't think it's hard, Miguel. I'm serious. Do you think that you could be able to do that? You're not able to do those things. Or just walk around you know, the streets of Kokoli because I am in Mubarak. I cannot walk. Isn't that amazing that we hear about the story of a man who was suffered from paralysis and four of his friends were you know, hearing about all that Jesus did in Capernaum and they just rushed to this guy and they wanted so desperately their friend to be healed and carried him all the way to where Jesus was. And guess what? As he was talking inside a house, he was absolutely mobbed. And the friends thought, I think they were geniuses. They just thought they'll go on top of the roof, take him rid of the roof, and just basically drop this man right in front of Jesus so that Jesus will notice what's really happening to him. And Jesus had, you know, of course, asked this man, you know, your, sin, your sins will be forgiven and just get out of the mat and walk. It's an incredible story, isn't it, when you think about it? If you could just picture the whole story. And we're just going to look into that story. And we look into the fate of these four friends who was absolutely determined to help the friend who is suffering from paralysis. And also how Jesus did not shun away or felt distracted or felt disturbed, but attended to this man immediately and to his needs, both his spiritual need and his physical need. And it's an important story, and I really hope that today, as we are meditating on this particular story, it'll speak to us, speak to our physical state and our spiritual state as well. The reason I asked you to just carry me all through the Kukhodi is like, just imagine people who just could just notice what on earth is happening to this guy. You know, there would have been a lot of buzz, isn't it? But on a spiritual level, I really want to ask you, can you think about a friend or a family or a member who is just going through a difficult time? Would we do anything and everything for this crush to carry them spiritually to where they have to be? And Jesus is calling us each and every day to pray for these folks, but also do our best. And sometimes our best could be praying for them, going and visiting them, picking up a phone and speaking to them, and taking them for a coffee, doing the things that, you know, sometimes in our busy lives, it's hard to do. So think about these folks that comes in your mind, and I really hope that this story will not only speak to you and your family, but also friends and family that you can relate to. And I really hope that it will be a blessing for all of us. Now, let's sing our second praise, Jesus Kind and Strong. It was a new song uh, that we learned last week, and I really hope that we can all sing together. Okay. Would you all like to stand up and sing the song that we learned last week? Jesus said, if I am weak, I 
should come to him no one else can be my strength i should come to him for the lord is good and faithful he will keep us day and night we can always run to jesus jesus strong Good morning. Uh, the first reading this morning is from Isaiah, chapter 43, reading from verses 18 to 25. Uh, the passage is titled, God's Mercy and Israel's Unfaithfulness. Forget the former things. Do not dwell in the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honour me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Yet you have not called on me, Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves for me, Israel. You have not brought me sheep or burnt offerings, nor honoured me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor wearied you with demands for incense. You have not bought any fragrant calamus for me, or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices, but you've burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offences. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and remembers your sins no more. The second reading is from Mark chapter 2, reading from verses 1 to 12. The passage is entitled, Jesus forgives and heals a paralyzed man. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, 
not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, then lowering the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your son sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Amen. Thank you, Andy. For the next praise, be still for the presence of the Lord. Be still for the presence of the Lord. of the Lord, the Holy Ones. Be still for the glory of the Lord is shining on the Father, what we know not, you teach us, Lord. What we have not, you give us. And what we are not, you make us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God always heals. God always heals. God always cures. Right, two weeks back, uh, we journeyed to the story 
in a defining moment of Jesus' work in Capernaum, focusing on this one individual where you know he drives out the evil spirit with the unmatched authority. And last week we were meditating on the story of Naaman. And today we are going to revisit Jesus' ministry at Capernaum. It's a great place because that was Jesus' ministry base. And he did uh, go around and met a lot of folks. He prayed for the sick. There was a lot of miracles that was happening. It was just not a location, folks. It was the heart of Jesus' ministry where his divine actions and teachings vividly came to life. And in Capernaum, Jesus' ministry demonstrated his might, his power, his boundless compassion. And returning there, when he was doing all these ministries, he faced a lot of skepticism and rejection. Oh, what happened to my microphone? I don't know. It's just falling apart. Just a minute. Um, there you go it's fixed now <laughs> sorry about that um, so he, he was just going around Capernaum and today we zoom into this very singular and poignant uh, story from Capernaum introducing us to a man who was paralyzed not only in his limbs but also in his spirit and this account transcends the mere physical um, because it delves deeply into the theme of you know, searching for God, obeying God, and a profound link between intention and movement, between the mind and the body. And this man's struggle uh, symbolizes Capernaum's own spiritual paralysis. Just imagine, Jesus is going around and praying to a lot of folks, and there's a lot of miracles, there's a lot of demonstration of Jesus' power. People witness and see everything that's going on, yet they don't perceive it, and yet they don't understand it, yet they doubt him. And this analogy is compelling. Capernaum became very static indifferent to the miracles they saw right before their eyes and the city's spiritual sluggishness is a direct reflection on what we are going through in Stockholm can you all are you all with me on that can you relate this story you know I've been told by the reliable, uh, reliable source on Wednesday night as we were practicing uh, in the choir that in the lands of five, the word paralytic <laughs> doesn't mean what's meant in the good old gospel. Yes, for the Scots, paralytic might be what you call a lad or a lass. He had a few drums of whiskey. Someone who's been overly acquainted with the bottle. Now, in case you're wondering if your minister has been indulging a wee bit too before preaching this morning, I assure you, I hope and pray the only spirit I've been filled with today is the Holy Spirit, not the spirit from the bottles. But the Bible says Jesus heals paralytic. We're talking paralytic, the word paralytic. And in the world of the PC culture, I just, I'm just quoting what's in the scripture, by the way. <laughs> Not that I'm sampling out, uh, you know, um, local brews in Fife. So don't be too stuck in this word this morning. But I hope you catch my drift. Jesus wasn't in the business of just small talk. When it comes to our struggles and our pain, and yes, even our sickness that's been keeping up all night, Jesus isn't standing just 
away from your bedside, disinterested. No, he's right with you. In the midst of all your pain and suffering, healing and mending, just like he did for this man back in the day. And let me tell you about the situation that you're all in this morning. I don't know what your personal circumstances are, but whether it's your health that's hanging by the thread, whether it's someone's job that's driving you up the wall, or your children's future, that you've got many questions. Jesus cares deeply. He's not a God who stands in some distance. He's a shepherd. He's tender and he's compassionate. He's deeply invested in every aspect of your life. And the story addresses something profound, folks. Jesus is offering a real deal. A real deal which is not a quick fix to all your problems. No, it's something far more meaningful. We're talking about forgiveness, restoration, and a direct access to God. See, Tim Keller says this, we are more sinful in ourselves than we ever dare believe. Yet, yet, we are more loved and accepted in Christ than we ever dared hope. That is the reason you and I are sitting here in this church. You see, Jesus didn't come to play the judge or point fingers. He wasn't doing that in Capernaum. You see, the religious folks did that every day. Jesus came to save and rescue us. That's his name means savior. And in the story, Jesus sees beyond our immediate wants, beyond our physical condition. And he addresses our eternal needs as well. Now, some folks today might reduce Jesus to a mere life coach. You know, I come from a land of religiosity. And there's a lot of religious commerce that goes on in India. I mean, when you talk about India, oh, you're the land of yogas, you're the land of spirituality. Many people come here. And it's easy to fit Jesus as a life coach in this world of health and well being. Because it's not fashionable to talk about Jesus. Oh, we don't talk about this Jesus stuff too much because it doesn't suit my personal and a political narrative. I know Jesus is a good man who lived with amazing principles, a righteous man, and he sprinkled a little bit of happiness to everyone performing these miracles. And he fixed all these minor issues. But that's missing the whole point, folks. Jesus didn't come to be just an add-on to our lives. He's not a personal trainer to your spiritual fitness. He came to address the deepest need in our personal lives. The need of forgiveness and a need more than that is a right relationship with God. And it's funny, isn't it? The religious big shots of the day, they caught on quick to what Jesus was doing. And there was Jesus stirring things up. And these folks, they started to question him and his authority. How dare you? How dare you? can say that you, uh, the sins can be forgiven. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They asked. And I found that fascinating when I was reading this passage. They knew the rules. 
And these folks are quite intelligent. They knew their history. Yet, they missed what's happening right in front of their eyes. They couldn't see that standing right in front of them was God in flesh, the long-awaited Messiah, offering the very forgiveness they said only God could give. Now this speaks very powerfully for us today with all the noise that we hear day in and day out, being bombarded with information. With all the noise we hear around us, can you just grasp what's really going around here? Can you understand what I'm throwing at you this morning? C.S. Lewis says this, and I love this. Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. There's no middle ground. There's no middle ground. Either the gospel we hold to stands as the truth, or it's the greatest hoax I'm ever preaching today. But I'm telling you that if Jesus wasn't alive, if Jesus wasn't risen from the tomb on the third day, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be talking about him today. The issue with our friend, this paralyzed man, wasn't merely that he couldn't move. No, it was deeper than that. His predicament was rooted in the stark reality that his limbs wouldn't obey the command of his head. He was labeled paralyzed, not just because of his immobility, but due to a profound disconnect. And I found that it's a troubling gap where his body failed to respond to his command of his head. At this man's physical condition, in many ways, is a vivid picture of what Capernaum was going through itself. Here's a city, vibrant city, buzzing city, with a lot of things that's happening, and Jesus made that city his ministry base for a purpose. People were flocking to him. He, they saw everything that was happening. He healed the sick. He prayed for the sick. There was a lot of miracles that was going on, and yet they did not perceive, yet they did not understand. Yet somehow they're stuck, unable to step forward in faith towards him. And that begs the question today, what of us? Are we so different from the people of Capernaum? In this age of endless information where you've been bombarded in an age of 24-7 insta world where everything needs to get done yesterday. We pray and we want instant miracle, like instant coffees. Everything is instant. Wars are happening all around. There's culture wars, a mind war that's going on as well. That's directly coming at us. And a constant chat about who is right. And who's wrong? Do we find ourselves overwhelmed and struggling to listen to the head these times? I'm not talking about our head, but the head of church. These religious leaders, well versed in history, folks, the laws and they saw everything and they knew everything, yet they stand baffled. Despite all their knowledge, they find themselves unable to comprehend the magnitude of what's really happening. 
Isn't that something? And Jesus tells this man two profound things. Your sins are forgiven. Get up, take your mat and walk. First he addresses his spiritual need, then he addresses his physical condition. And just like that, the man gets up and walks. And again, the religious leader is just seeing all of this and is crying out foul and screamed blasphemy. Foul! How dare you, Jesus? How can you forgive this man's sins? Can you imagine being there? Seeing this all unfold in this modern world, just picture yourself, time travel, maybe. It was a declaration of Jesus' authority, his power not just to heal the body, but to restore the soul. And imagine this scene being recorded in your mobile phone. This will be a viral video. On Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, the man and those four friends Real heroes, look, just imagine their faces, by the way, probably couldn't believe their eyes. Imagine maybe this man's wife thinking, oh, is that my husband walking through that door? The disbelief, the joy, it's almost too much to take it. Now fast forward to us. Here and now. And I want to ask you this question and close. What if we could sit down with this man over a coffee and ask him to share the story to us? He would probably start with, all I wanted to do is just walk. But then, Jesus hit me with this real truth that my heart needed the most healing. Jesus is either who he says he is or he isn't. There is no fence sitting with this one. The entire New Testament is where our faith hinges on. On the reality of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. And let's not forget that he is still a God who relates to us, who comes to us, who seeks after us. And if Jesus didn't walk out of that tomb, we wouldn't be talking about our living Savior today. Why would we? Why would I come from India believing in this story? To come and stand before and serve as a minister at Kirkode. Why would we? A carpenter from Galilee, no matter how wise or miraculous, wouldn't stand the test of time without this resurrection. And this Jesus, he's so much more, folks. And for those who are watching online, he's not just a life coach, he's a life giver. Uh, the religious folks back then thought in the same lines and they missed the point. They saw Jesus is healing, forgiving, and they thought it was utter blasphemy. And they knew everything but missed the very heart of God. And they were paralyzed spiritually because the head knew many things, but the heart was not accepting. Can we relate to this? So that's the real question. Do you know this Jesus? Not just know of him, but know him in the way that transforms your entire life. But he offers each of us the gift of new life and a fresh start each and every day. Because his grace and his mercies are new every morning. So what's got to do with you? What's got to do with me? What's this got to do with Kirkcaldy Hope Church? 
everything. Everything. If Jesus is alive, it changes the entire game. It's a moment that demands we take a stand. Not like people from Capernaum. Either we believe that Jesus is who he says he is, God with us, our Savior, or we don't. But if we do, if we embrace the Savior, it changes everything, folks. It means there's hope, there's healing, there's cure, and yes, there's forgiveness for every one of us. So what do you say today? Are you ready to believe in Jesus? Or is it going to be a battle of your head and your heart? Can we believe that Jesus not only talks the talk, but walks the walk? He brings new life. So I really hope as we listen to the next song, that it will be not just words that I spoke, but it will be a real transformation for all of us, for our friends and our family, for those who are seeking for this breakthrough in their life. And that transformation will come from the inside out. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the stillness of hearing your word, we feel called to recommit our lives to you. We recognize the times we have doubted, we've strayed, because we are fearful and doubtful. But we choose to come to you. Give us a new life and a new start. Give us strength through every trials and be the beacon of hope and transformation. And as we listen to the next song, Lord, let's step forward, renewed, ready to walk in faith for the glory of your name. Amen.
to step into your world, to touch your wounds, heal your brokenness, and walk with you every moment of your life. And may the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds as you live and move in him. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you, both now and forevermore. Thank you. 